Hello. <clears throat> In this final video on the properties and uh, syntheses of alkynes, I want to share just three types of reactions that are more recent developments in the synthesis of alkynes. Uh, the first one is called the Cory Fuchs reaction. Uh, Cory Fuchs reaction uh, takes an aldehyde, so this is a different kind of starting compound uh, than we've seen in some of the other videos, reacts it with triphenylphosphine and carbon tetrabromide. Uh, this makes a 1,1-dibromo alkene, uh, which then reacts with butyl lithium followed by aqueous workup uh, to form a terminal alkyne. So here's a little bit about how this reaction works. I'm not going to talk about this first step so much. Uh, this first step is like a Wittig reaction, uh, which I'm going to make a video on uh, somewhere in talking about the behavior of carbonyl compounds. Uh, and so you can go watch a video, uh, read about the Wittig reaction, and maybe you'll be able to figure out uh, how this first reaction happens. <clears throat> the second reaction, uh, butyl lithium will react with these 1,2-dibromo alkenes to do something called alpha elimination. So it removes the both bromine atoms and leaves behind this strange looking intermediate called a carbene. Uh, a carbene is an intermediate carbon that has two bonds, one lone pair, an empty orbital, and no formal charge. So you, you can do the math, figure out that there's six electrons there, uh, so the carbon is neutral, but it's also not happy because it has a, a lone pair, which carbon doesn't care for, and an empty orbital, which carbon doesn't care for. Uh, and so one thing, uh, because this carbene is not really all that happy that it can do, is this internal rearrangement where the hydrogen atom can move to the carbon and the lone pair can move in to form a triple bond or form a new pi bond, and then we get a new, or we get, we get our terminal alkyne. Uh, and as I discussed in the video on the acidity of alkynes, butyl lithium is a strong enough base to deprotonate this alkyne as it forms. And so actually the acetylide anion forms, and then we need aqueous workup to uh, recover the uh, terminal alkyne. Uh, this reaction also works well on ketones. Uh, the carbene forms, but instead of having a, an alkyl group and a hydrogen on it, it has two hydrocarbon groups. One of them moves, turns out to not matter um, which one of them moves, uh, and you get an internal alkyne. Uh, one of the two R groups on the ketone has moved to the, to the other side. Uh, a third modification, or another modification of the Cory Fuchs reaction has instead of using an aqueous workup where, where we're providing a proton to the acetylide, we can honestly uh, add any electrophile here that we know will react with acetylide anions, uh, so alkyl halides, uh, other carbonyl compounds, etc. cetera. Uh, and so this is actually a pretty powerful technique to take an aldehyde, uh, extend it by a carbon, turn it into a nucleophile, and then add additional carbon atoms or other functional groups to it. Uh, a second kind of reaction is called the Gilbert-Seaforth homologation. Uh, the Gilbert-Seaforth homologation uh, likewise has an aldehyde and a ketone version, um, but because of the way this reaction works, it's not possible to go any farther than the terminal alkyne if you do the uh, aldehyde version. Uh, in this case, the, the Gilbert-Seaforth uh, reaction starts with an aldehyde and reacts that aldehyde with this uh, diazomethyl uh, phosphonate, uh, weird looking compound here, uh, weaker base potassium terputoxide, lower temperature of minus 78 degrees Celsius. Uh, the initial outcome of this first reaction is similar to something called the Horner Wadsworth Emmons reaction. It's, it's similar to, to the Wittig reaction. Again, I'm not going to talk about this, this first step here, uh, but after the first step, you form this diazo carbene, uh, which can lose a molecule of nitrogen uh, to form our carbene intermediate, which rearranges to the terminal alkyne. Because the base we're using, potassium terputoxide, is weaker 
than weaker base than the acetylene anion, we don't have to worry about deprotonation. We don't need to worry about aqueous workup. Uh, and like the Cori Fuchs reaction, if we started with a ketone, we end up with an internal alkyne. <clears throat> the final example that I want to share with you is the Sanagashira reaction. Uh, the Sanagashira reaction uh, is a reaction that starts with the terminal alkyne. It takes advantage of the base, uh, the, the acidity of the terminal alkyne. It adds a palladium catalyst, which can activate sp2 carbon halogen bonds for different kinds of reactions um, and we use a copper compound copper iodide in most cases uh, to help shuttle the alkyne uh, to the palladium and uh, so in this case we are forming a new carbon carbon bond between an, what's going to be an acetylide equivalent and an sp2 hybridized carbon something we can't do with the SN2 reaction. Uh, there are two sort of preparatory steps uh, that need to happen before the, the main event. One of them is called oxidative addition. Uh, in the oxidative addition step, uh, the palladium reacts with the carbon halogen bond and inserts itself into the carbon halogen bond. Uh, you're gonna see I'm not gonna draw any arrows here. Uh, these kinds of reactions don't often have electrophiles and nucleophiles uh, the way that many organic reactions do. Uh, the transition metal uh, has other binding bonding uh, modes available to it, so it, it, it does other things. Um, but the palladium inserts itself into the carbon-halogen bond. There are a couple of ways this could happen, but it, it happens. Uh, it's called oxidative addition because we're adding carbon and halogen to palladium, and it turns out to be uh, a formal oxidation of palladium. So palladium goes from palladium zero to palladium uh, two plus, I'm sorry, palladium plus two. And then separately, the alkyne is reacting with the copper compound in the, the presence of triethylamine as a base uh, or, or any other kind of appropriate base to form the copper acetylide. And so instead of you know, instead of having yes, any regular or any old acetylide with any counter ion over here, um, in this particular case, we have the copper attached. Uh, and like the butyl lithium I talked about in a previous video, this copper acetylide is not exactly an ionic compound. The, the carbon-copper bond is pretty covalent. Um, so the carbon is holding on to the alkyne as an acetylide equivalent. The most important step in this reaction is something called transmetallation. Uh, when the copper acetylide and, and the oxidative you know, palladium comp uh, intermediate come in contact with each other, uh, the copper and palladium switch uh, partners. The alkyne moves to palladium or the acetylide moves to palladium and then the, the halide that's on palladium moves to the copper. And that regenerates the, the copper halide that can be used uh, in another step or to be, go back and form another copper acetylide. Uh, and so you don't actually need a full equivalent of copper for this reaction to work. And then it generates a, a palladium compound that has both our aromatic ring and our acetylide on it. And this thing undergoes a, a process called reductive elimination where the pair palladium kind of squeezes out of here uh, and forms a new carbon-carbon bond. And again, this is uh, considered uh, reductive, a reduction for palladium, it goes from being palladium 2 to palladium uh, 0, and it regenerates the palladium atom that can go back, or the palladium catalyst that can go back and, and start over another oxidative addition. I just wanted to give you a, a flavor of some other reactions that are out there. Uh, all too often in, orga in an introductory organic chemistry, we get uh, bogged down in the tried and true uh, and the things that we've always taught. But it's a good idea to, to share that organic chemistry is an evolving field and new reactions are being uh, discovered all the time. And actually, all of these reactions uh, date from the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and so there are even newer things out there. This concludes our, our group of videos on the synthesis of alkenes, or I'm sorry, the synthesis of alkynes. Thank you for watching.